Hi everyone and welcome back to the basics of CFD implementation series. In the last tutorials, I talked about the lead driven cavity flow and the shell flows. And I also talked about writing your own code for the lead driven cavity flow problem. And I was really happy to see that some of you, you guys, you wrote your codes from the sketch and you showed it to me and some of you wanted me to debug it. And I was really happy to do it for you because it gives me immense pleasure to see when somebody uses your tutorials to do something for their own. So in this particular case, we are going to do a channel flow with a circular cylinder presence inside the channel. And this problem is called as the flow over a cylinder. So we are interested to know what happens when we put a cylinder inside the channel. So because of the presence of cylinder, the flow pattern is changed and we are interested to see what happens downstream of the cylinder on this particular side. So in this particular problem, I'd be taking two Reynolds number into the picture. The first one is 10 and the other one is 100. And it is said that if the Reynolds number is smaller than around 80, then the flow is steady. And if the, flow, if the Reynolds number is larger, the flow tends to be transient. And that's what my motive is to show you the difference between the steady and the transient flows. So basically, I'm simulating the, both of these cases, assuming that the flow is transient. But as I will show you later that for the lower Reynolds number case, the flow tends to settle with time because it, it would be steady in nature. And that's why the transient effects would be diminished. So let me first show you the geometry. And I've already simulated these cases because they take a lot of time and because I've run them for a lot of time, physical time. So that's why I won't be doing the entire case right here. So the geometry is very simple. This was the channel initially for our last problem. And we just put a cylinder over here. So I just put a cylinder very near to the inlet so that uh, there won't be any uh, loss of, you can say, computational time. Because if you put the cylinder over here, it would take a lot of time in the physical picture to see the effects so that's why you can just put it near the inlet so what i just did is i created two surface the first surface is the entire rectangle including the circular hole and the second surface is only the circular cylinder and then i used a boolean operation in which i subtracted the cylinder from uh, the entire rectangle so that gave me this particular part you can also create this sketch uh, by simplifying it uh, into one sketch of a rectangle and inside the rectangle you can just draw this circle and create a surface from sketch it will also give you this particular uh, final product but i'm interested to show you about the boolean operation that you can use the operation like subtract to drill or to cut the holes uh, cut the holes of any shapes into a body uh, there are other options in boolean that you can also add uh, two kind of bodies into one so after we create the geometry the next part is to mesh so in this particular case uh, the key point is to remember is that the mesh should be uh, finer near the boundary of the circular cylinder that's where the flow will hit. So if I just generate the mesh based on the default parameters, I get a mesh like this. So it's not too bad. Uh, I mean, you get the basic idea because that this is the Cartesian coordinate system and this is uh, the curvilinear coordinates. I won't say the system, but it's easier to interpret the rectangular surfaces in a Cartesian system because of the X and Ys. So what I'll first do is I'll reduce the maximum face size. So right now it's 1.1. I'll reduce it say 10 times. So that's, that gave me 0 0.1 and I'll update the mesh. So my aim is to reduce the, the element size here and reduce the element size here as well. But this should be much finer than what we have over here. So yeah, as you can see that overall the mesh the element size is reduced and the mesh looks OK. And uh, to increase the density of mesh over here, what I will do is I'll use the sizing feature. And I'll pick this particular edge of the cylinder and 
I'll say that um, I will want an element size of 0 0.05 meter. I mean, you can hit and try with this particular. There are a lot of features. There are a lot of features which can help you refine and coarsen the mesh. So again, this is a tricky part in any CFD simulation that uh, your mesh should be fine. But at the same time, you need to be considerate about the performance or about the time that it's going to take. So right now, I, I, there is not much effect on, on the mesh that is near the boundary. So we can reduce a bit further. So we'll wait until the final meshing is done and then we'll export this particular mesh to the setup and then we'll assign the boundary conditions and the solution parameters to see what is the difference between the steady and the transient flow. Yeah, right now, as you can see, the mesh starts to get quite fine near the solid domain. And also you need to assign these particular walls as the inlet, this wall as the outlet. So I can show you that in the final mesh that is over here. So basically if you look into any paper about the flow over cylinder, you'll uh, most probably you'll see uh, the flows with higher Reynolds number and what happens at the downstream side of the cylinder is that you observe a series of vortex, a series of alternating vortex, I'll say. Even if you can see in the Fluent logo, you can see that there is a cylinder. So that's pretty interesting. So you can see that it's not just a problem. It's, it has become a logo. So, okay, so in the boundary condition, in my boundary condition, I have an inlet, outlet. These are the walls of the cylinder, the parallel walls. And this is the cylinder itself. So I'm using a laminar model and then I choose the air, but I change the parameter. So it's not really air, it's just an arbitrary fluid. So my density is one and the viscosity is 0 0.01. This is the dynamic viscosity. And I gave the inlet velocity as one. And I forgot that uh, the diameter of the cylinder is also one. So if you put this into the Reynolds number, you'll get the Reynolds number to be 100. And then you can use the reference from the inlet. And then I also monitor my CD and CL. For for the transient formulation, I choose the second order implicit in time because uh, I was using a time step of 0 0.25, which is significantly larger. So uh, it's better if you use a higher order schemes for the higher uh, for the large value of time steps. So I ran this simulation for a total of 75 seconds. And the same goes for the case of Reynolds number 100. I'll show you here. So even for the Reynolds number of, of 10, I assume that the flow would be transient. I, I didn't assume that it would be steady. I, I know by literature that it's steady, but uh, we have to understand that how it becomes steady. So for even for the Reynolds number 10, I said that it is transient. And the only change was of, of the dynamic viscosity. So I changed it to 0 0.1 rather than 0 0.01. So that would make my Reynolds number 10. And I also run the simulation for, uh, you can see here, uh, for the 75 seconds in total. Okay, now I'll show you the results that I got. So for results, you can see a variety of results. So usually uh, there are some sort of vortex contour, vorticity contour, or the velocity contours whenever you visualize a flow over cylinder. So in this particular case, I, I will first show you the, the results for Reynolds number equal to 10. So the first thing to see is that this is the U-velocity contour. And uh, I'll slow the video down a bit so that you can see what's happening. So as the flow enters, it goes around 
and there you go there you see that the flow doesn't change much with time and that is what i was talking about the flow getting steady so in the steady cases the flow doesn't change with time that is a one key key observation that you can see here even though my solver was unsteady but the flow is invariant with time so what that means numerically is that in your continuity and your momentum equations the delta over delta t terms that is delta rho over delta t in the uh, in the continuity and the delta u over delta t in the momentum equations those terms they tend to be smaller and smaller as the time progresses and they ultimately they become zero and the unsteady uh, Navier-Stokes equation they become the steady Navier-Stokes equation so if you want to solve these numeric uh, these equations numerically you can just skip the the unsteady term as we did in the case of lid driven cavity flow we just use the unsteady term for the iteration and we saw that uh, after the iterations those terms were negligible and that's what that's what is happening here that after a long time you you don't see the effect and then we'll move for the Reynolds number to be 100 I'll slow it down even further because the animation is fast so as you see here the flow it's it starts to progress and then these are the vortex that I was talking about as you can see these they, these are the vortex that is that that tends to create that tend to be created on the downstream direction of the flow so this is called as the von Karman vortex street so these are the vortex the, the first vortex is from this particular the upper side of the cylinder and the other vortex is from the lower side of the cylinder so these are the alternate vortices that are formed after the flow is passed over the cylinder and they tend to continue and that that is what makes the flow transient and these vortex they never tend to settle down so in this particular flow you also experience that the lift and drag coefficient the lift coefficient it keeps on changing because of the alternate nature of the vortices but in the case of steady flow the lift coefficient is it it gets a constant value after a certain time because the flow around the cylinder it doesn't change much but in this case the flow around the cylinder it keeps on changing let me show you it one more time so the flow it starts it starts naturally just like the steady case but after a certain time the these vortices are created and this happens because of the boundary layer separation so if you have already read about it you might have heard that uh, because the flow crosses over the cylinder that is why there are adverse pressure gradient in the downstream direction of the flow and the boundary layer tends to separate and there are some kind of uh, recirculating or the backflow that is caused uh, i can show you this because we have the velocity vectors in my study so you you can better visualize it what happens especially when we have a situation like this so i'll just go to the final time which is 75 seconds in the physical zone and then i'll use the vectors So yes, I'll even increase the numbers. Yes, so now you can see over here, this particular part, so just after the cylinder because of the boundary layer separation, some of the fluid, you can say the lump of fluid, it starts flowing backwards. So this is called as the recirculation and so there is a reverse flow in this direction and these are the vortices i'm talking about so the flow gets around like this and this phenomena is not constant with respect to time so if i say switch to some other time you could see a slight change in the flow and this keeps on happening 
So if you if you are using some sort of softwares, it's it's not very complicated to deal with the boundaries because the software they have inbuilt libraries to handle the complicated boundaries. But if you're writing your own codes, you need to have an understanding of certain methods such as the immersive boundary methods. And there are certain other methods which you can look into if you want to write your own codes. So for this particular problem, I hope that you get certain uh, understanding of what are steady and transient flows and what happens when you introduce a obstacle into the flow field. Um, what could happen to the lift and drag because these lift and drag coefficients, they, they get really important in engineering applications such as the airfoils. And yes, and I think that that would be helpful to you in certain sort. And if you have any kind of problem, I would be happy to help you in any possible way I can. So thank you for watching the video. I hope I benefit you.